I did want to ask you about your tango week. My tango week? Yeah. My tango weeks have been very different lately. Um, I haven't been going out as much. Yeah, same. And I've been dancing a lot in practice. I have a new practice partner who is like very eager to practice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, most of the time I, I work with people who um, we sort of have to plan in advance and it kind of happens once in a while, maybe once a week or so. But with her, she really wants to practice multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a big shift for me to go into this mode where 99% of my dancing is really happening in practice. I'm, I'm mm. spending a lot of hours dancing, Yeah. but it's really with one person and it's the most focused I've ever been uh, in my dance. Like mm. when I go social dancing, it's, you know, it's like whatever it is that day, that night, it's, it's a very open-ended sort of experience but when i practice it's a little bit more like all right why are we here what what what's well presumably to, to for the purpose of practice yeah but right but it's like okay so we're practicing what is it that we're going to practice oh gotcha right so it's yeah, a little bit more make that decision business but it, do you feel satiated in your in the amount of dancing you get to do if you are practicing as opposed to going out to social dance yeah, that's the part that I'm asking myself, actually, because I haven't gone out dancing socially, and every time an opportunity comes up, I sort of decide not to. I mean, they dropped all the episodes of The Bear this week. <laughs> I mean, what were they expecting did, us to do I Friday did. night? Uh, but also, I'm wondering if it's because I'm being satiated in this new way I feel very creatively stimulated mm -hmm. through the practice that there's something that I'm getting from there that I feel sort of at peace with that it's okay for me not to go out. Maybe mm -hmm. one is sort of satisfying me more than the other right now, but maybe also I, I'm finding I go through these uh, periods where like I'll dance a lot in a short period of time and then I'll sort of check out for a bit mm -hmm. and maybe I'm just feeling that lull right now yeah you know because i've had a couple of conversations um with a, a friend when where the term envy came came up uh i don't i want to be careful and not describe it as envy but i'm very happy for you that you have this practice partner and the ability to work on your tango in a very deep way and there's a, a part of there's a desire in me for that as well like i i kind of when when you're watching your videos and i kind of i happen upon them and yeah you know, i'm like you know because it, it kind of started out mm -hmm. though i was just i was just kind of like there i was like okay let me look at this for a little bit too and then now sometimes i'll watch like a whole performance with you because i'll see how the, they're dancing and think i want to dance like yeah. that yeah there's something yeah. very inspiring about it and yeah. For, uh, our and you'll get to work on that so so much in this very yeah. deep, uh, specific, intentional way, as opposed to my B student approach <laughs> to like, yeah, well, there's a Sunday belong, I mean, I'll go out and I dance six times. It's not like I had an approach, honestly. Um, it's not like it's been part of my practice. But when I started practicing, I just asked myself, well, like. Whoa how do I even approach this task of practicing something? And um, when I started that process of watching the videos, I kind of remembered what it was like at the very beginning when I started dancing tango, when it was so fun to stumble upon really amazing videos. Mm -hmm. And tango felt and looked so fantastical like how is this happening in fantastic front of, you know in front of my eyes and that's all improvised right and 
now I'm, I'm looking at it from a very different perspective because at the time that I was going through this, I was a hundred percent follower. I only followed, I never thought about leading and my eye was drawn to the follower and I was really watching the follower. And that's a very common aspect of, you know, being a tango dancer in one of the roles, you'll tend to watch one of the people. You can't watch both of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. But now I'm doing that. I'm training myself to do that as a leader. Uh, and it's very hard. It's very hard to train yourself to watch the other person. And so for our listeners, I'll just describe my process because I, I think it's a very effective process for anyone to do. And the, the magic is you take a performance that you really, really love, which I picked this particular demo. And what I really loved about this particular video, it's a demo at the end of class where they're showing a principle over and over again. So the video itself is cohesive in a very different way from like a typical performance. So if you pick a video of a specific sequence that you really love by a, a teacher, and it's like a two minute demo at the end of class, and then you s watch it once through with the music and then watch it at half speed or quarter speed, rather the slowest that you can do yeah. without the sound on <laughs> definitely. And you just watch it and, and then you go practice and you try to recreate what you saw. Quarter speed is the right speed for yeah. tango. Like when I to saw it tango. happen, yeah. I was like, wow, this, I mean, it just, it, it, makes it was, sense. it was great. Yeah. You could see the, uh, acceleration yeah. of the yeah. body of the steps of how, uh, you might create, um, dynamism in your, in your partner yeah, through exactly. your. Exactly. Super fun. Super fun. So yeah, so I've been doing a lot of that and I feel I, I have a new uh, sense of excitement about my dance perhaps yes. for that reason, because now there's all these like questions about what I'm capable of and what I can figure out. I'm, I'm very, I'm excited <laughs> for you and, and I'm, I'm, I'm also, I'm also want, we, we need, I want to dance later. <laughs> Actually, I want to dance and in I our living that. room I later, honey. That. I hope, I, I hope me doing this inspires other people to do the same. Cause yeah, I, I think definitely. it's a really great practice. Well, but video is not what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> Just the music. Just the music. There are so many things that you can know about the music that don't help you at all. But but the, but the 1947 version of El Choclo, he he actually says he kills the woman. He doesn't just allude to stabbing her. He, he I know exactly. There's there's like a lot of obscure knowledge. That although right now I'm wishing important. I had them. I I, I had a good one because I don't think that I one mean, makes it. Somebody's going. El Choclo doesn't have lyrics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Nerds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the level of nerdiness that you can have with tango music obviously is endless as with anything that you can really get into. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who uh, gain a lot of historical knowledge of the music, maybe even uh, meaning of the lyrics. They might know a lot about the context in which the songs were written and really geek out on all of this information mm -hmm. but ultimately it doesn't necessarily get applied in the dance so in this episode i thought uh i really wanted to reflect on my own experience as a dancer and at what point were there like these nuggets these insights that i suddenly gained that then became a big part of my musicality and, and became something that I use all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a handful of these moments, whether it was in someone's class where I heard something that triggered my imagination a certain way, or maybe it was a sensation I had at a particular milonga. Um, I have you know, several of those. And I think everyone who dances tango has similar moments. For sure. For sure. For me, one of them, 
Marcato and four. And it might've been something that I was, I was, I was helped by, but I, I didn't really understand it as a, as a concept until very recently when I took a, a online kind of video musicality course. You're talking about Horacio Godoy's yeah, musicality yeah. course. And, yes. and I'm, I'm sure I heard the, the term, but I think just sort of being immersed in that kind of almost like an academic environment, what it, it made me realize is that the kind of songs I really enjoyed dancing to early on and even now are ones that have Marcato in four because it's so forgiving. So uh, what is, how do you understand Marcato in four? How do you interpret that concept? That, that, uh, every beat is pronounced. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every like beat Marcato of, of in a... four, there's Marcato in four and Marcato in two that we dance as dancers, right? But if you talk to a musician, he'll say, no, everything is Marcato in four, right? They'll say all tango is written in Marcato in four. And it's like, that is true. However, we as dancers, we either dance the accent. So we either dance like accent on all four beats that the orchestra is playing, or we dance, you know, some other accent or we choose. We actually all, all four as well. all four beats. I thought when you said accents, I thought you were gonna you were referring to like there being only two accents per, but not right. necessarily. Whether you're dancing on all four beats, right? Which is Marcato and four is dancing right. all the stepping on every beat of the four beats, right? Or Marcato and two is you're stepping on every other beat, right? Right. right. And then that is either pronounced in the music, like you can either hear it in the music or you actually choose to do it. Yeah. Some songs are because every beat is there, you can kind of step whenever, whenever you beat. need. So <laughs> it's like the, the things that might kind of create a more musical looking dance um, I'm not saying you can't do that in Marcato and four, but it was like, if I was off balance mm. and I just happened to need to step, I could it's step. There. It's there. It's uh, like, it feels like it's clouds that are just there as I jump from one place to the other. And with music like that, for me, I feel safe. Mm. I feel a lot less in up elements. in my head, right? In I'm elements. in my element. And so those are the sorts of songs where I feel like I could take risks. And I mm. think that helped it, it just sort of like recognizing that, oh, this is a song that's going to be really forgiving. When I learned about the difference between Marcotto and four and two as a follower, you know, I, I think I understood the concept physically before. I understood it conceptually because mm -hmm. as a follower, you yes, end up same. actually yeah. feeling all of these things and you recognize them as like, they're almost reflexes you can't track. Right. So you already know this, but you don't understand what you know. Yeah. I liked Pugliese before I, I understood anything about tango. Then I realized I hate Pugliese. <laughs> I don't want to dance this. All right. And then I understood why I don't want to dance Pugliese because it has no marcato in four right it's oh, it's all it's all like uh except for like a couple of like moments i think that's why i liked it early i was thinking it was like la yumba like when it comes in with that boom 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 yeah boom. Yeah, yeah 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 um as a follower you know these concepts just through physically feeling them mm -hmm, and yeah. later i learned yes what it actually meant and when i learned it conceptually what it really clarified for me is when do I need to be fast? Because early on as a follower, I had a really difficult time with speeding up my dance. I did really well on slower songs, disarly, late disarly, something that, you know, takes a lot of time. Pugliese was actually pretty easy for me right away. Um, that kind of stretchy quality, I had mm. it naturally, but if I danced with somebody who wanted naturally. to dance with me, <laughs> naturally. Know, I'm a cat. What can I say? Oh, oh, I, now nature. I understand hundred percent. Sure. Agreed. I'm like, look what I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But, Honey, it's a podcast. <laughs> I know. It's leopard print, everyone. Those of you who are just listening. Um, so, but when I danced something like Darienzo or like a fast milonga, it was really hard for me to keep up with the leader. I felt like I was dragging. It was like I, my reflexes weren't fast enough. And mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out how to interpret like where my reflexes needed to go. Like what was the signal? Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the signal. I didn't understand where the information was coming from. And so then when I realized that in the song itself, there are these segments of the song that kind of dictate to you mm -hmm. what the song wants, like a really fast variation 100%. at the end of a Darienzo song. It dictates to you something very specific. And I, if I can clue into that and know what that means, I can then anticipate yeah. and I can be just exactly on time without stressing, without working really hard. You know, it like really freed me up as a follower and made me a lot more adaptable. Like that's when I started enjoying dancing that kind of music. hundred percent. it made me more, you know, adaptable to different kinds of dancers, you know, because yeah. you'll get a, a full spectrum of leaders who will either dance it very conservatively and just focus on small steps here and there, or you might have leaders who are really going to want to put in a lot of stuff and move really dynamically. So. Yeah. And I can feel what that memory was of not knowing, is the song going to keep going fast this whole time or does it, when do, it might stop whenever. <laughs> when does it end? Right. But, but if you kind of understand what that yeah. Mark Conto and four is, you kind of like know how long it is that you're going to be stepping on yeah. every step. Yeah. You can also maybe assume that your leader, if you're a follower in this case, that your leader is going to step on every beat as well and kind of lead you to do that. But it's not a rule either. Right. It's and, not. And yeah. you might at some point dance with someone who steps on every beat for that particular section. But if you two are connected... You can do something opposite. You could do something a little bit like, hey, just, just to remind you, yeah, like we're totally. creating this right now. Yeah. For me, I think uh, when I started tango, I don't know what it was like for you, but I did not like tango music. And I talk about this a lot is that like as nerdy as I am about it now, when I first started, it actually didn't sound like music to me. It sounded like gibberish. I didn't enjoy listening to it. It was very taxing. Anytime I tried to listen to it on my own, like outside of a uh, Milonga environment, it was like I could listen to it for maybe 15 minutes and then I had to just turn it off. Mm -hmm. It was very fatiguing for my brain. Yeah. I and, thought people that liked <laughs> tango music were just weird. I, I, I grouped yeah. them all into that weird. So I you, was like, you didn't like it at first either? I mean... I didn't have much of an opinion, but there's people that love tango yeah, music, there's some right? People and so who are when just, you're starting tango, it's yeah. a little hard to understand, like why? why what deal? is it? Yeah, a deal? lot of these songs sound exactly the alike. Same. They don't sound. I don't know. There's a sense <laughs> to me that they don't sound complicated. Yeah, though they are maybe complicated, but they're also not. You know, that that's the sort yeah. of journey. You know, right. Circus music. That's like the only way I felt that it actually approximates correctly how you feel about it when you first. Yeah. It's like circus music. There's no but there's, understanding there's, how it fits into your uh, context of music. Yeah. You know, there's there's plenty to mine there. So it's kind of like how I imagine like when people are really big fans of jazz might yeah. be a little bit totally. awkward at a party where it's like. I get it, bro. Yeah, You're like, really you been, into jazz. Have, college, have you ever been to an experimental jazz house party? Have no. You, no, uh, no. Oh I think God. that was more in the uh, MFA program. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, we weren't really doing that. In, so uh, this is my BFA years, Rebel. actually. So I'm like sophomore in college or something, and I get invited to this art party at someone's house, and they're going to have experimental jazz, and you go there, and you're sitting in, in these rooms, and it's all like quiet because like the performance is happening in one of the rooms, and there's like some really weird art hanging on the walls. And then there's just like these obscene noises resembling dying elephants coming out of the room with like these weird layered 
percussive sounds and mm -hmm. like it's really you did not bizarre. enjoy it no but then you know it's like art so everybody's talking about how profound it is and you know yeah. like you and act I get like it. you appreciate well that's the it. thing and, and when you and when you are part of that conversation and you are not really in it or you don't feel like you have yeah. the yeah. capability of contributing or understanding <clears throat> then it, that's when you tend to be most dismissive and exactly. and I, was I was dismissive yeah. i was very dismissive totally. i was like okay i get it but um you know did you hear that new eminem album <laughs> right i was like so for a long time tango music was just this kind of wall of music that didn't exist in any way uh in certain in terms of like understanding what is really involved like what is tango music what is what does it look like when tango music is being played live who is who is involved and when i would hear names like di sarli or biagi or danturi or somebody would throw out a name like podesta with this like reverence in their voice i'd be like what's the big deal with these with these names what are these names for um are, are these people are these styles of things are these things like what is what is disarly mm -hmm. and so i remember i was taking this musicality workshop the very first one with alex krebs in portland oregon and i remember him explaining that these names were the names of the orchestra leaders so you know like biagi is a person and he's an orchestra leader so when we're talking about a biagi tanda mm -hmm. we're talking about a collection of songs that were played by biagi's orchestra and notorious biagi <laughs> biagi <laughs> you did it better than i did honey. I know. <laughs> that's what i was going for i completely no, muffed it didn't, you didn't, you didn't. Notorious Biagi? No, you got it. Notorious Biagi. <laughs> <laughs> so, at that moment, I thought, okay, so there's there are these people with these names, and they are uh, the leaders of these bands of music, mm -hmm. musical bands, and they make their own arrangements of. The same songs they're all playing the same songs ultimately mm -hmm. that, that that was sort of tied with this uh insight that you have these orchestras who are all playing the same set of songs it's like saying that you're gonna have 20 singers and they're all gonna do a cover of new york new york mm -hmm. and it's gonna be their version of that cover so the song is the same right but the way it's expressed is going to be different and each orchestra has their own flavor yeah that they're putting on it their own spin yeah and you know to extend that relationship to the dancer then it means that our job as a dancer is to be sensitive to those changes and express the individuality of the particular orchestras so to me it it basically created a link between okay what is it that i'm doing in my body these movements called ochos boleos whatever cross and how am i supposed to dance that based on the music like what am i trying to do am yeah. i trying to go on the beat all the time and the answer to me was i'm trying to do it in the way that showcases the color of that orchestra of the particular orchestra okay so, I, it, it it makes it a lot harder too because we're not used to that in the way we ask somebody what a song is mm -hmm. so when i hear a song i go oh what is that i ask you know i'm gonna get the maybe the name of it but usually just the artist mm -hmm. and the artist in this case might not be the person who um created the song created the song right. although i guess in a way it's like yeah you can have you know usually you're, you're talking about the performer and in this case the orchestra leader is the performer yeah he kind of stands in for the whole orchestra his name stands for the whole orchestra and then you know then you sort of realize that some of these orchestras you know there were people 
that were part of the orchestras that broke, broke off. off. Like and then Biagi, it becomes, right. And Biagi then like somebody's a pianist, the pianist for Darienzo, and he broke off and he created his own orchestra. So then you hear Biagi's influence on Darienzo's music for a right. period of time. And then you hear Darienzo's music change when Biagi leaves. And those differences are part of your listening, mm -hmm. right? Like part of your active. Yeah, not a required music. listening. Right. Um, I mean, you don't need to know those aspects, but that is part of the fun. Once you kind of have that understanding of the music, it might be interesting to then create something <laughs> in your dance based on that knowledge. Yeah, that's just to say that the inspiration is endless. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many ways you can. You mean <laughs> it's new like, every night? It's new. It's very like, exciting. This is, this is why. Um, this is why tango music is addictive. I think because mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter how many times you dance the same songs, every time you dance it, it's different because. It's a different night. It's a different floor. It's a different person. You're wearing the different thing. You're in a different mood. And there's something inexplicably mysterious about that with this music, mm -hmm. that it has this quality that you can listen to it over and over and again, and you constantly find something new in it to dance. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that journey became obvious when I learned this fact, then I was like, okay, now I understand that my task is to categorize what I'm hearing, to recognize the differences between these orchestras so that as a dancer, I can have that as part of my experience. Because I just noticed that when I know these orchestras, when I got to know them and I was really dancing more for the purpose of matching the music, um, I enjoyed it more. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it was, um, possibly the reason why I stayed because if I didn't stay, it was like, it was kind of boring as a follower, especially to just execute the moves over and over. It was like, what else is there? Yeah. So the music was kind of the opening of this next dimension for me. My second, uh, item was my understanding of the seven, the pause on the seven. Uh, I was uh, with my my original two <laughs> teachers, Mitra and Stefan, just hearing, being told to listen for this idea that you'll hear a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. That that kind of pattern mm. to listen for that in the song, because you're going to often pause on that seven, like that's that's something that orients you the 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 scene of the phrase <clears throat> right in this one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five or seven uh was was like a it was like understanding how a very elemental building block could be placed and how i could dance within that so you're saying this concept was the way you interpret it is it doesn't matter what you're dancing as long as you're you're dancing out the pattern that you're hearing in the music. I think it, it just orients, it orients you to not, you know, okay, here's a song that's two and a half minutes long, but it was like, I could hear 10, 12 second chunks of the music. Oh, so it's like organized chunks of music in your mind because you could perceive this pattern repeatedly. Right. Yeah. When you're describing that you're, looking for that place of chunking different sections of the music so that you can pause. Right. Right. That you know where to pause. Right. I think that's right. very useful. Versus like dancing all the way through it. Right. And maybe using right. a pause and you could use that pause in the sequence, but it was just, it's a way of, of making a song that's just gibberish to right. me. Right. Right. At least sort of saying, okay, there's an A section, a B section. That's, that helped also to understand, like, what are the sections of the songs? What are the phrases within the songs? Would you say that this idea of the seven that you're describing is this, uh, also this A, B section? Is that the same thing? Are you describing the I, same thing? I don't think I'm, I'm quite describing the, the okay. same thing because I think, um, you know, an A section might be more like 30 
to. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's it's sections within sections. It's yeah. more like smaller chunks yeah. of phrasing. So the way you apply it in your dance is to know when to like land and pause. Yeah. And it's very much like learning to ride a bike. I think this ability to predict in the music when the, those pauses are going to arrive. I learned a similar lesson with, uh, for example, with valse, because mm. at the in valse at the end of the phrase you'll hear, dum, yeah, dun, 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 dun. Dun, bum, bum, bum. and it's like you listen for that, and you can choose to show it, you know, and it provides you a way to organize the little. Uh, sections as you said. Yeah, I'm, I'm so pissed when I miss it. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to show it every time. I think it can get pretty repetitive because yeah, it, it yeah, does it happen. Totally, it like, can. Yeah, uh, almost there's every hundred percent. Sometimes there's there's like uh, Vols Tondas where you're like, I, I I come away and I didn't enjoy it because it felt like incessant. Yeah, it felt like it never offered <laughs> an opportunity to do anything beyond just kind of go to someplace else and just step on every beat. Right. Which but again, it kind of comes to you choose, right? It's yeah. like it's in the music. Yeah. So you have the opportunity to do it. But then if you do all of them, it's like, you know, that's where musicality starts coming in as, as a concept, right? Like your ability to choose what you're going to do with the music and having an awareness of how you're making those choices, the ability to pause and knowing where to pause that is basically what phrasing is, mm. right? And the way I describe the idea of phrasing to uh, my students is imagine that you are writing a poem. And if you were to have that task, you would understand that you would be arranging your poem into stanzas in a traditional mm. kind of structure. So the each line of your stanza is going to make up the section and you have the next section and you sort of have these groupings. Yeah. And that's basically what it is mm. when you're dancing tango. And that phrasing is this ability to tell where in the music the end of the sentence is and the next line begins. Then when is the big break between the two phrases? When when do you shift from section A energy to section B energy, because mm -hmm. those a lot of times are contrasted within the song. So all of these things are part of phrasing. So whenever that term would come up uh, along the way, when I was like learning about tango music, I, I kept trying to figure out how to actually phrase. Like I understood the concept, right? I could break it down, but I didn't really know how to do it. And I think you're stumbling into the same insight through this feeling of the stumbling is how I usually get around. Yeah, I know. Like, and I, I think we all end up stumbling a lot. That's uh, why I like Marcato and four. <laughs> so I think you're tapping into the same insight, but for me, that insight happened when I was in a class with uh, Pablo Inza and Sofia Saborido from years ago in Portland, they came and they taught this workshop. And they gave us this task that we were going to walk. And it was one of the very first workshops I took as a leader. So it was very new to me to, to be in that context. And they said, what you want to hum the song either in your mind, or you can sing it as you're walking. And whenever you're done humming, like you're, you're out of breath because you've sung a line of the song, you pause. And then when you sing again, you start walking. Mm -hmm. So you match the singing of the melody with where you're going to pause. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the simplicity of that concept. That's just... like linking your breath to your asanas. <laughs> in te in uh, yoga, of course. So that's actually because, you know, I'm very familiar with that idea for yoga. I understand that. That to me was like, oh, that's what phrasing is, mm. right? Like, how would you phrase the poem if you were to say it? Ah, right. The leap is that it's not just a written poem, but it's like, how would you actually say the poem? How would you deliver it? Right. And when you hear the singers, 
sing those songs, like where, whether you hear uh, Fiorentina versus Podesta, what they're doing is they're phrasing this poem of a song in their own way and they're putting their own flavor to it. Mm. So as dancers, we're kind of doing that mm -hmm. when we're dancing these songs. Yeah. So to me, it was a huge revelation because then it linked up everything about my experience. I realized that when I'm dancing, it's like I'm tracing the structure of the song. I'm tracing out the components of the song. I'm getting to know where's the syncopation in Biagi's Belgica, which is one of the hardest songs to dance ever, or, you know, some other weird songs that have extended notes. Like you learn to recognize those moments mm -hmm. because your task is to like identify in, Wait, in is Belgica mind. the one where that guy goes? Uh, no, it's it's instrumental. Oh, it's the one that goes ba da da ba ba da 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 so, yeah, so that was a huge um, piece for me that now really affects how much I know about the music. Like, that was really the beginning. That's when so something turned on in my head, and then it became effortless for me to be interested in tango music, mm. like, as a pastime, mm. because I suddenly understood, understood what the point was yeah. as a dancer for me. Yeah. Great. When you hum songs, you really do kind of know, yeah. know the song. and. You know, I've hummed songs for you, and, and you look at me like, <laughs> like you, you, like you, like no one would understand what song I was I was humming, and I'm I'm certain that I'm humming it just the way it is, uh, perfectly. But that's that's usually not the case. So we're we're gonna test that out. We're gonna test right, that out. He's going to hum a song, and I'm going to attempt to recognize yes. what he's humming. Yes. But uh, an upcoming so bit. So far, so far, it has not happened that I I have not actually recognized any. But uh, you know, maybe it's you know how like you learn to understand your baby when they're. <laughs> You learn to it's understand like I'll my learn baby to understand humming and how you're humming because this is like your your emerging um, tango voice. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna have to find a way to cut all of that out. Um, but I do need to like come back to that point about humming, which is I used to think that if you if you really knew the songs so well, wouldn't you get bored? Mm. And there was this feeling of potentially being boring in my dance too, because I would, I would just know the song so well. And I would, I would dance it the same all the time. Now I understand that to be a way for me to hear more of a change in dynamics, mm -hmm. to hear certain sections or specific instruments and to incorporate that into my dance. You are pointing out a threshold of sorts for musicality. I recognize in myself, I, there was a phase where my whole point of dancing was to trace out the song perfectly, to get every detail down. And eventually it got boring to do that because I just knew the song so well. So structurally, it was not as interesting for me to to seek that. And I didn't really li like the way it looked. And so then the question became, well, what else is there? Mm -hmm. And that's, you're pointing out that next level where you realize that yes, there's the structure, but then there's something else. And the best way I can understand what that something else is, is the way Horacio Godoy explained it. And he said, musicality is, you know, you can be one of the instruments, right? You can uh, basically represent one of the instruments in the orchestra. You can mm -hmm. be the violin, can be the bandanion, or you can be an additional instrument. Indeed. Right? Like you can be a different instrument. And he showed us an example of uh, a milanguero that he considers to show this kind of dancing. 
And I wonder if I can pull it up for our listeners because it was really interesting for me to watch it. And I wonder if other people would think the same. It did not look musical to me mm. because he did not go with the music. Mm -hmm. He was his own instrument and he's considered to be one of the greats. Mm -hmm. And it was such an interesting idea. I don't really know what that means yet for myself. I'm in the middle of asking that question. But the metaphor, metaphorically speaking, it works to say, yeah, there's this level of understanding in the music that you can achieve that has to do with just the structure, the knowledge of the orchestras and, you know, the basics, which is basically what I love teaching. You know, I, this is, was what I taught all year last year in 2023. I took a group through 12 months of understanding all these foundational things. But then once you know that, the next level is the fun part, mm -hmm. right? Is where you you get to be, you get to choose. Mm -hmm. You choose to be the instrument in the song or you choose to be your own instrument. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talk about really knowing the songs, I think one of my formative inspirational experiences of the music and how deep the music can be was in Buenos Aires uh, when I was attending a milonga by myself uh, at Salon Canning one night, and next to me was a table full of dancers, one of which was Fernando Sanchez of Fernando and Ariadna. They were sitting right next to me right okay, there. Okay, I think with, I know who that is. You know, with their friends. And it was a valse tanda by DeAngelis, and they were singing the songs, the really fast DeAngelis songs, mm, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. they were singing them and they were tapping it on the table and they were all together. They were singing them word for word. And I just soaked that in because it was like electric to know. I was like, there's no way I could ever approximate the, the depth of what they feel towards that music because they grew up around it, mm -hmm. you know? And so how, how profound that is for them. Like it's, it's in their bones and it was very beautiful. Mm. So for me, that kind of possibility of having that impact, that excitement about the songs, mm -hmm. you know, that was a, a, one of the first examples. During that trip as well, um, I think that those kinds of formative experiences kind of led me to understand this relationship that we have with the orchestras, because it was one of the first times that I started really feeling the differences between the orchestras when I was dancing. And I think that idea that each orchestra is like a very individual experience, that each tanda is almost like a portal into a different movie set, a different storyline, a different sort of realm. For me, that is where most of my musicality is now. That's kind of what I'm really interested in. When it comes to studying music, I always, I always like getting into the music. I always feel like the music is where the least amount of anxiety resides. It's like, really? yeah, just because when I'm dancing and I'm thinking about the music mm. and dancing to the music, those things about boring my partner kind yeah, of go it away. Makes it, yeah, it makes yeah. it so much better. Yeah, so no, it I, may, I, and it makes you a better dancer automatically. Yeah. Everything that you actually need to know for your dancing, you know, to be a, an exceptional tango dancer is already in the music, mm -hmm. Like the music ultimately is the teacher, Yeah. but you need to know what to listen for. Yeah, definitely. You need to understand yeah. how to listen to certain parts of the song and how to interpret them. And at the end of the month on July 26th, mm -hmm. I'm going to do another webinar that's going to really focus on that skill set of connecting the conceptual understanding of something like Marcato in two and four mm. melody versus rhythm and actually tracking it in your body and understanding how to do those changes, how to shift those things inside the body to communicate. Are you going to, you going to show that like on, on video, like how you might dance? Like, yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to really go through the actual concepts and then you don't need a partner for this, which no. is important well. because I don't want people to get stressed out about having to find somebody to do this with. These are going to be exercises for you to just do on your own, which uh. a lot of the musical knowledge or, or musicality training that you 
need and you can have can happen on your own. You don't have to do it with another person. So yeah. the exercises I show in the webinar are going to be something that dancers can do on their own gotcha. uh, and have it as just part of their practice uh, and apply it in their everyday lives. So that's kind of the the goal is to get it in your bones. Tool. Yeah, get it in your bones. In your muscle memory. Yeah. Once you know how to do it, you can do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that's kind of the the idea is that once you understand how the game is played, you mm -hmm. know, then mm. you just start, start breaking the, the rules. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You play the game, then you start breaking <laughs> the rules. <laughs> fun. All right. So uh, if you're interested in that webinar, check out the link in the show notes and let me know if you have any questions. And send those song descriptions in for any that we should be. Yes. A reminder. Yeah. If you know any songs that have some, some racy lyrics yeah. that we don't um, typically talk about. H help yeah. me do my research <laughs> for me. All right. We'll chat with you next week. Um, until next time.